So, I'm just going. I'll talk very briefly about myself because it's really not so relevant, um, and then a little bit more about the approach to investing, and then a bit about um, investment trusts because um, one of the things that that I do do is manage an investment trust called Brunner, um, and so I'll mention that very briefly. I asked my son, who's an architecture student, if he would just do a little, a little, you know, cartoon for me about about what it might be like being um, a female fund manager. And so he did this. And he's never been to, to the kitchen in our office. But actually, I mean, it really does look quite like that. But the only thing, bless his heart, is that he couldn't imagine a, an environment where there was only one in 10 you know, it, people as a woman. He just couldn't, I mean, it was not in his brain that that could be like that, and that it is. So he, he produced this um, with obviously a little bit of sport chat going on you know, for just a bit of authenticity there. But in real life, those two women at the end would be men, and then you'd have another three men there as well, all in the same place, and that would be real life. And, and the really astonishing thing about that as well is it was like that when I started. So that was you know, 30 years ago more. It was like that, and it has not changed. And so over the last couple of years, I've been involved with some other senior um, women in, in the industry, just seeing what we can do to actually improve the situation. And all around, the, you know, throughout the industry, it is improving but not actually in those managing the money itself, which is just nonsense because all the evidence that there is shows that women are as good, if not better, on a risk-adjusted basis than men, and that actually the best you can have is a mixed team. So, you know, the, as mixed gender is good. Um, so, so those I've spoken to earlier who were sort of, you know, investing with their husbands and things, you know, that's, that's mixed gender, that's good. So anyway, that was, a, that was a starting point. Um, we are trying to improve it. So then the investment approach. And so, so you've, you, know, you know about active and passive. Um, I mean, I've spoken to a few of you earlier, and I was, I was told, oh, we don't know much about investment. We know a lot about investment. Um, so uh, so I, I will, will pitch it at a relatively sophisticated level. And uh, tell me if you're not following, but I'm sure you will. And the active and passive, um, I've been an active investor all my career. And, um, and in what I do, which is global investing, it makes sense. So your average global investor will outperform the index over time. That's not the same in other parts of the market. So if you're investing in purely in the US, then the average manager doesn't, the median manager doesn't outperform. So you need to get a really good one there. Uh, in the UK, it's, it's the same. But in some areas, in global, there are some more anomalies. Um, there's this less really efficient markets, and there's possibility to, for the old median manager to outperform. So you don't need to be brilliant to do it. That helps, but you, know, just, you don't need to be. And then also in small cap, that's another area where it makes sense to be active, because there's more anomalies, there's less research, there, and so it does make sense to be active there, get a good active manager there, and also emerging markets as well. So some of the frontier markets that Holly was talking about, being active in this does make sense as well. So, so the actual passive. So, so in some areas, have your ETF, you have your passive, your cheap passive. That makes sense. But then in some other areas, and global is one of them, if you can find a good global manager, then you can add some more value on top of, of what your index is doing. So that is a, a you know where do you do it? And then when it does matter through time as well, the active and passive can move slightly differently together. If you've got sort of a long bull market, you know, and everything's going up then you can really sort of be quite, quite passive and just enjoy, enjoy the ride. Um, in more choppy markets, you know, and they can go on for, for a few years, then it can be that it makes sense to be a bit more active. Um, and doesn't mean necessarily trading around it, but it does mean that you've got to, you know, there's more potential downside you want to avoid. Um, and it does sort of sort the sheep from the goats when you've got those sort of environments. And obviously in a, in a real bear market, then, then it makes a difference too. So the sort of the when makes a difference as well. And then, then how you do it? Well, the way that, 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 that I uh, have, have always done it is quite concentrated investing. And um, all of the evidence, you know, when we've looked back in time of those who can really outperform over time. So, so those, you know, there's a handful, really, of, of investment houses which have shown over time that they can really do the job in global. And they tend to be co quite concentrated portfolios. And, and I always thought it was a sensible idea because, you know, actually, for what Holly said, you can't know about that many things that well, you know. So, so what you really want to do is, is to understand, you know, some things very well and make, and make those your positions. Um, and be very careful when you are, you know, buying a new stock 
because it is, you know, it's going to have an impact in the portfolio. If you have too many in there, you just it, nothing matters so much, you know. So you need to focus the mind. Um, and so, so the how that's that's you know how I do it, and how you know when I look at the, the competition, how the best are doing it as well. There are other ways that work as well. Um, and then, um, yeah, so find, finding best opportunities and understanding the risk of it. Uh, now, this changed over time. So the time that I've been investing, um, really, when I started, the, the, it was really when quant was beginning to get going as well. So, so having the ability to use computers to screen through and using those in, in a global universe makes you know, it's huge sense because you've got so much data there to look at. So if you can use screening as well, that makes a big difference. So that's something that I've always used. And now screens can also have more AI in, and language processing and, and more and, and different models going there as well to help you just screen through and find out what's looking interesting just for a starting point. And so myself, um, I, I have a, a, a team of, of people in, in London and Frankfurt. My, my global team is about eight of us. Uh, but behind us, there's a, a few hundred people around the world in San Francisco, London, Frankfurt, Hong Kong, Tokyo. And they're all doing investment, um, all equity investment in um, uh, looking at, you know, across all the different sectors. And then we're connected up. Um, so that we can discuss it. So we've got, you know, fundamental um, analysis going on. We have portfolio managers. We also do the ESG research, which we really connect into the fundamental research. Uh, we have that quantitative, you know, research that I mentioned. Uh, we have macro, um, which we listen to but are not driven by because, as Holly said again, you don't really know what's going on, but it's well to have a sort of have a, a thought about it. And then. Um, the last piece I think um, I haven't mentioned there, or have I mentioned all, oh, grassroots, which is actually specific to us, um, something that we do. So we think being connected is quite important as, as investors. So you know, having a lot of smart people around the world is a good start, but if they're not speaking to each other, you're not really getting the benefits of, of what you're doing. So we do all you know, connect ourselves up. And the way that we do that is, is through something called Salesforce Chatter, which is, is like a sort of you know, Facebook for our, for our investors. So we're all connected up on this. And on, on this, every time you know, we go and see a company anywhere in the world, then whoever is it will put it in here. Uh, all of the uh, ESG research is in here. All of the engagement we're doing with companies is, is in the voting. Um, and then, very importantly, all of the discussion that we're having a, around the platform about a particular stock is on here as well. So you've got that sort of long audit trail of the, of the conversations that have been had. So really, it's sort of all of the intellectual capital of the company all in one place. And as a, as a user, you, you, know, you put in and you take out. You, you know, when I've seen a company, I will put put stuff in, um, and then obviously you're taking out um, from, from all your colleagues. And um, the other thing which we do do it as well is, is you can have themes and topics that you can put in. And so if there's something like, for instance, coronavirus you know, going on, um, then you have a little you know, group of people who will be talking about that and the impact on their stocks and, and they connect up. And when people have been talking about something, then they will get, get tagged as experts um, or, you know, People of int you know, interested in it, um, and then they will they will um, be uh, connected up to have that that sort of subgroup, and and we've done that you know going through the, the U.S. Uh, China trade war last year we were doing the same kind of thing. Um, uh, if there's any you know, particular issues of, of geopolitics which you know people want to want to you know connect up about or do or about you know, specifics about what's going on in the repo market or you know whatever, so so it's it's a way of just getting those conversations you know coordinated and keeping a record of, of what we've all been up to and uh, what we said about something. So it's, it's, it's been a great way of getting people all sort of connected. So uh, grassroots, I said I was going to mention, because, because grassroots is something that, that uh, we set up in the 1980s. And it was really as a response to, to the criticism that, that uh, investors are very ivory tower. Uh, that they just sort of, you know, come down from from the uh, the ether and, and say uh, that this is what I think is going to be the growth rate for this company, um, and and the colleagues who had had uh, started it up were in San Francisco and they had invested in in a, a company called Warner Communications, which made uh, Atari game system. Now I can barely remember this, so I'm sure none of you will, but um, it was a, a company which after the Christmas. Uh, had a terrible profits warning, and the stock went down about sort of 60, 70 percent. 
And so it was a really bad day. And then the head of research went home, um, saw his, his, his family and said, you're bad at the office. And um, his son said, you know, what happened? And he said, well, what happened? And his son said, well, Dad, I could have told you that. But, I mean, you know, Nintendo, that's what I got for Christmas, you know, remember? And uh, that was why the uh, head of research decided he was going to start this, this research so that he would never again be in the situation where someone who was not a financial expert knew more about it than, than he did. And so, so uh, that's why I set it up. So what it does is that you know, when we're investing in a consumer company or a tech company or healthcare uh, company, and there's a specifics about a product or a service that we want to understand a bit more about, then we will set one of these surveys off and we will we'll go and find out a little bit more about it. Now, it may not tell us what we wanted to hear. It may not tell us, uh, I mean, it may tell us something completely different, or it may tell us nothing at all. It may be very, very gray, but at least we will have gone and asked those who are really, um, you know, closer to the ground to understand what's going on in that company. So, so we've used it for you know, cardiac stents, we've used it for Disney theme parks, uh, I'm talking to travel agents, um, and we will use it um, for every, you know, every tech product that comes out, we'll, we'll tend to be asking around it. So uh, it's, it's been a, a very helpful way of understanding more about what we're investing in. And, and I think you know, the whole issue of what risk is in financial markets, you know, the, the question of you know, financial risk is, is, is you know, often said to be volatility, but it, the real risk is losing money. And losing money is very easy if you don't understand what you're doing. Um, so the more that you can understand, even if you don't understand everything, you can't say what's going to happen next, at least you've done your bit, that you've really done as much diligence as you can and asking people on the ground of what's going on. So this was one that we did last year. And this was a little bit more of generic about an industry, but Estee Lauder is a stock that we've owned in the portfolios for, for a number of years. Um, and it's been a fantastic um, performer. Uh, what we were interested in this particular thing was to understand what it was, the way that people actually you know, bought cosmetics. Because a couple of years ago, there were some you know, new you know, online uh, cosmetic, both brands and retailers started up. And there was a sort of concern that, that this was going to be the only way that anybody ever bought cosmetics again, because that has happened in, in, in some categories. Um, so we wanted to go and, and ask. And so we did a survey uh, saying, you know, how do you like to buy cosmetics? And... Um, and these were the results. And it was interesting because it was, it was counterintuitive. And we thought there would be certainly an age um, you know, bias here, that, that, that the younger consumers would all be wanting to buy everything online, and the older ones would be much happier buying things in, in traditional in sort of department stores. But it actually wasn't. It was much more mixed than that. And across every age range, um, that, that, that women said that they liked having both. They liked actually being able to go into shops and try, you know, try things out, but then they also liked being, buying things online. So they actually wanted both. And that, for a company like Estee Lauder, which is, you know, started on a traditional, you know, within department stores, but then has gone very successfully online, both through online cosmetic retailers, but also with their own, you know, direct to the consumer, I mean, that showed that, that they were doing the right strategy. So it was right to have a sort of a hybrid, not to just give up all of their offline because people still wanted it. And it also meant that that did have a bit of an advantage over some of the purely online um, brands that were coming. So that, that was interesting, and that's the sort of thing that, that we can do with it. Um, now, I won't go through all of these, partly because I've only got seven minutes left. But, um, and I didn't specifically get all of the female orientated stocks in the portfolio, but this one's a little bit you know, sort of more, more female orientated in that it's um, a workplace nurseries. Um, and this was one that we bought, actually bought, bought last year, um, really focusing on the, on the trend of more female participation in, in the workforce, which is happening everywhere except asset management, as I mentioned. Um, but it is a, a very interesting um, that they've managed to keep quite steady growth and, and good returns, and they seem to have quite, a, it's, it's actually quite a, a, a decent return and with business with pricing power. And we actually did a bit of grassroots on this one, which was seeing about the quality of and the turnover within the staff, because the most important thing in this sort of business is the quality of the childcare and the quality of the people that they get. And so that's what we were really checking on. And, and the, the morale is good, the uh, churn is very low, and they do, they, they have a very good flexible policy for their own staff, and they also help them with, with tuition as well. So, so the feedback from the, the, the staff that, that we, we talked to was all very positive. So that was um, another one. Um, yeah, uh, IFF is, is um, really benefiting from this shift to, to more natural um, food, 
and, and fragrances. And so they're right sort of in the, in the middle of that one. And, and this is one which um, we quite like because uh, we got a, a very good valuation opportunity of it last year. But I'll, I'll, I'll t tell people later if you're interested in it. But um, I'm not doing single stock you know, pictures. I'm just trying to get an, I you an idea of, of how we go about it and, and what we use. Um, and then a couple more, actually. Yes, the, these next two are, are, are really you shifting into that, that, you know, where is there a good sort of structural trend? You can't say what's going to happen with growth from quarter to quarter. You can't really say what's going to happen with coronaviruses. But what you can really, really sort of pick in is when there are very long-term, you know, mega trends going on. And there's one of those is it's digitalization, which we are, you know, have been really expecting to see go through all different industries over, over the years. That's still ongoing, and that's a very long-term trend. So we've got some, you know, stocks which are favoring, favoring that. Um, this actually goes into a little bit in that, but it's also into the next real sort of long-term trend as well, which is, is that of, of you know, decarbonizing the world and greening the world. And what, what Schneider do is energy management companies, and they also have a business which they started up recently, which is to do with helping their customers decarbonize. So it's like a consultancy, and then they then you know, move into to help them do it. So they're really in the sweet spot of, of all of that. Um, and they've been building up their software platform for the last few years, which has depressed their own profits, which means that they actually are sort of the stock is even cheaper than it looks. So that's always interesting. So that, that's an interesting one. And um, Ibadrola is, is in the same kind of theme, but it's, it's uh, a company, and it's a, a Spanish utility which moved very, very quickly to, to shift into alternative en energy and has now got a consultancy business you know, globally around the world, which is, is really benefiting from that trend. And then the last one I was going to mention is uh, CSL, which is one of the, the two um, of the uh, plasma um, suppliers in the world. Uh, them, and there's another a company called Griffles, which do the same. Good um, growth company with some very good um, uh, technology themselves, but also good returns in the business. And, and it is a business which is very, very difficult to actually get into if you're not in it already because of, obviously, safety and also the security of the supply of getting, getting um, the, uh, the quality of, of the plasma that's required. So that's, um, that's another one, but also different, you know, different uh, and idiosyncratic risks in, in these, these companies. So that's that, and I have three minutes to talk about investment trusts um, and Brenner, which I'll do quickly. Um, now, investment trusts, I mean, I am a huge fan. I, I invest in them myself for my pension um, and have done for years. Um, and uh, I manage this, uh, the Brenner Investment Trust as well. So from uh, managing it and from buying it, I, uh, I'm a big fan. And um, obviously, I can't tell you everything about investment trusts if you don't know in, in, in one minute. But um, the things which are, are different about investment trusts, which uh, are important to know, is, is that one, they have an independent board. So they are like a company rather than just like a fund. And they have an independent board, and these boards are made up of individuals who are, over the years, increasingly well, you know, sort of um, good quality people. I would think probably 20 years ago that wasn't necessarily the case, but there's been quite a, a big improvement over the last few years of getting good quality directors in these trusts. And so you get that independent board who's also looking after your interests for you, which is obviously a good thing. Uh, then you have um, the second thing is it, it because it's uh, a share of a company you know, rather than buying into a fund, that means that um, the underlying fund manager doesn't need to buy and sell shares if the shares of the company are being bought or sold. So if there's a lot of sellers of, of the, the, the trust, it doesn't mean that you have to sell everything in the trust itself. You, it, all it does is, is change the, the share price. And so you do get uh, this more flexibility for the, for the uh, portfolio manager. It means you don't need to make silly, de silly decisions and sell things at, at the bottom, which is good. Um, it, you can get some debt in there, which you know, it can be good or bad, but over the long term, having a little bit of, of, of leverage into the market is, is, has been a good thing. And then the last thing is that um, you can also hold uh, some reserves in the trust so that if there is a difficult year in the markets, and there often is, then you can still keep your dividend being paid because you have a reserve to pay it out of. And that's, that's an important difference as well. So that's investment trust. I'm going to have one minute on the Brown Investment Trust, uh, which is a very old trust. It's been around since the 1920s. Um, and it's got the family of the Brunner family is still own 29%. 
and a member of that family is also on the board as well, who's a, a private equity guy and you know, fully qualified to be talking about investment. Uh, it is a, a global growth and income. Um, I've been managing it overall since 2016. Uh, previous to that, I was managing the overseas part since 2005. And um, we've done quite a lot of changes to over the last year or two to um, bring it together, to make it more concentrated in the way that I said uh, that I think is works. Um, we have restructured the balance sheet to get the, the, the debt, uh, the cost of debt down. Um, and we have um, uh, changed the benchmark to take it more overseas. So all of those things have happened in the last few years and, and, and it's uh, performing nicely. And um, yeah, it runs off the process that I mentioned with the team and all, all of that you know, research behind us. So, um, so that's Brunner. Do have a look, and it's still a discount. And time is up. So I was going to just leave, leave with, with this, um, you know, the, the fearless girl. And, uh, and I think it's, it's not just about being brave investment. I mean, you know, bravery can, can uh, be silly if you, if you don't want to do it. And standing in front of raging bulls is not a good idea. But um, it, I think it is, there is something about, about taking a bit more risk. Um, because it's, it's obvious that, that um, women need to be pulled a little bit more to take the risk, whereas men need to be sort of shoved back down a little bit. And that's, you know, I know that, you know, from obviously what statistics say of, of, of men and women investing, but also by having a team where I've got a mixed team and I can see how people behave. Um, and, and I think there is, there is something about that once you've done your research, you're comfortable that you actually have done the work that you need to do, then you just, you do need to be, you know, a little bit brave. So I will leave it there and, and any questions, very happy to answer sort of now or later.